So for all my friends and uh, followers over in Hong Kong, hope you can heal okay. Uh, sometimes even with, with our Buddhist society over here, sometimes it just happens that Oh, that we get viruses in our computers or whatever it is. Sometimes the PA system and the recording system and the streaming system is not that good, but hopefully it's okay. If it's not okay, then we have everything recorded in other ways, so we'll stream it to you later on. So hopefully it works out okay. So tonight's talk, Peace in Turmoil. So sometimes life is tumultuous. But is that always bad? Sometimes, whenever we look at our life, sometimes we can look at our life, our situation, in a privileged form, not realizing at this moment, at least we have a full belly, we have a place we can sleep at night, we have good friends. What more do you want? And sometimes, Human beings, we want too much and we don't know how to be satisfied just with small things. This is one of the wonderful things I was taught as a young monk, to be satisfied with little, learning how to be content with just simple things, so you didn't need so much. And in fact, we have this a simile for Buddhist monks and nuns, only to need four things, and those were clothes for the body, food for the belly, a lodging for keeping you quiet, for resting, and lastly, medicines in times of sickness, which included like food. So if you have those, they call those the four requisites, then everything else is extra. I always remember that and I have to teach that to monks when I ordain them. Remembering just how much you really need in life and what is really important. So what happens when we have a change in our situation? Sometimes people are very reluctant to actually to go with the changes when we can't go to where we want to because of some sickness or when the life doesn't seem to be as peaceful as it was last year when there even like riots in the streets and we wonder about our future. You know people have been doing, there's nothing strange about that. People have been doing that for centuries and millennia. Turmoil is part of life and in fact if life was really peaceful if everything went our way, we wouldn't learn very much. Sometimes people expect this world and this human life to be perfect. And it doesn't need to be a, a, a genius to know this life is never perfect. But it is pretty good when we know how to make use of it and to learn from it. When we see suffering, it's our opportunity to be kind. You see someone hungry, opportunity to be generous. When somebody mistreats you, it's the opportunity to forgive. Without those opportunities, where would a really important part of life be? Sometimes uh, we get things all wrong, and our priorities are all messed up. I like the idea of priorities, because the story which comes up into my mind, and of course you all know I don't plan these talks, Start somewhere and see what comes up. On priorities, that it was only <laughs> about a couple of months ago, one of the old stories which I used to make much of came back up again. And I've been using it for many talks, especially for those of you who don't know. I just recently, actually just last night, I returned on a flight from the Far East. I went to the Far East for four days to Sydney and Canberra. That's what I call the Far, <laughs> the far East. Yeah. And so I was giving lots of talks there and this was one of the similes where, where the professor came into the room 
and he never said anything to his students but put a big jar on the desk in front of him an empty jar and then reached into his briefcase and took out a number of stones and put them into the jar one after the other until he could get no more stones in the jar at which point he lifted up his head and asked his student is the jar full? and they said yes sir he smiled reached into his bag and got some gravel some small stones out and managed to squeeze many of those in the spaces between the big stones and when he could get no more small stones in the jar he said once again is the jar full? and of course this was a university and they realized they were tricked once they won't be tricked again so they said no he smiled and got some sand poured the sand on the top of the stones and the, the small pebbles shook the jar and much of the sand found its way into the spaces between the rocks and the pebbles is the jar full now? they shook their heads in negation so he got out the water and poured the water in until he could get no more water in and then and then he asked what's the purpose of this simile now many of you may have remembered your time at university you've seen other kids at university or school and you can understand their response which was this proves to us sir, that however full our schedule is we can always fit something more in <laughs> no he said that's not what I'm trying to demonstrate what I'm demonstrating is if you want to put the big rocks in the jar they have to go in first it was a story about priorities so whether it's at difficult times or peaceful times in your life whether you are sick or you are healthy what are the important stones you want to schedule in first put them in first otherwise you'll never get them in at all so it's prioritizing and even in times of so-called difficulties and turmoil when we feel we can't go to the football or we can't go to the royal show we can't go to the, the was it the Formula One race over in Melbourne or whatever else you know people really like they like those things fine if they want to go there's no problem at all but is that the most important thing in your life? so it's getting priorities solves a lot of problems in life about what is really important which means our life has less turmoil even though other people are running around even though other people are complaining even though other people are fighting it reminds me of one of my favorite stories it's actually not a story, a poem which I read when I started off as a Buddhist still a lay person and that little poem goes it's easy enough to be happy easy enough to be happy when life goes along like a song but the one worthwhile is the one who can smile when everything goes all wrong have you ever felt like that, like that in life? everything's gone all wrong so what do you do? smile <laughs> they're not going to put you in the mental hospital they're going to realize that you can see something which other people don't what are you seeing over there? you're seeing the priority to solving problems is learning how to be peaceful and happy until there is something you can really do because this story, just when I heard I was supposed to give a talk on this subject tonight I actually agreed many weeks ago but never thought of it until this evening and it was a story about how learning how to be peaceful helps turmoil peace in turmoil if it's in turmoil, if it's a difficult situation being peaceful is not going to help at all you've got to do something, don't just sit there, do something I think it was actually Venal Tignat Han 
he was the one who turned that around and said, no, don't just do something, sit there. <laughs> Turning around, he's recognising the importance of sometimes relaxing, resting, being at peace. And of course, this particular little tale, it was just, it's a way of mind, a way of looking. And this story did not come from any Buddhist text at all. This actually came from a a friend who was a senior teacher when I was doing uh, teaching, talking about turmoil, teaching in a high school in England so many years ago. That was turmoil enough for me. But anyway, this was a senior teacher who just was just having a cup of tea during a break in lessons. And he told me that the story, which I think many of you may know, but it's a powerful story. And I remember reading this story, somebody saw that they'd read this in one of my books and they put it in the newspapers in Thailand when there was problems with the yellow shirts and the red shirts, I think when they were taking over the airport many years ago, when there was big turmoil, political turmoil in Thailand. And this, new, this story, they put it in the newspaper. They acknowledged it came from me and they actually, um, somebody over there saw it and cut it out and sent it to me. And that was the story of this gentleman, this teacher, who was a young man in the army in Burma during the Second World War, what is called Burma. And he was with a few other soldiers, and what did he, what happened? They were on a patrol, a simple patrol, and they had a scout, maybe f six or seven, eight troops, and the, sc <coughs> the scout told them, the bad news. They had wandered into the middle of a huge number of enemy troops. They were completely surrounded, totally outnumbered, prepared to die. So, what would you do if you were in that situation? At war with an enemy thousands of miles from home surrounded, outnumbered, ready to die. What would you do? Anyway, the captain, the senior officer, knew straight away what to do. He said, everybody sit down, we'll have a cup of tea. Excuse me. <laughs> That's what they did. They had a cup of tea. So how can you really think of having a cup of tea when you're surrounded by the enemy about to die at war? The Second World War. But that saved his life. Because what happened next? If they had tried to fight their way out, imagine someone trying to be a hero, trying to sort of take their guns and go through this. I don't think they'd even... Was John Wayne born yet? Oh, what was the other guy? Die Hard. Bruce Willis, that's right. You know, sometimes when I first started going teaching overseas, people actually compare me to Bruce Willis. They did. Only because we were both bald, that's all. That's the only thing we shared in common, baldness. <laughs> anyway, back to the story. Yeah, and sometimes people will feel that way. They've got to do something. And how many times when you feel you've got to do something, it all goes worse? And it certainly would have done then. So instead, sit down, have a cup of tea. And this man, you know, he was actually the head of English in this school I was teaching. He said that was what he wanted. He wanted a fight. And when his boss, the captain, said, sit down and have a cup of tea, he thought that was the most stupid command he'd ever heard in his life. I know it was British Army, but having a cup of tea when you're about to die, when I first heard that, I, I, I thought, you know, stupid Ajahn Brahm similes, I thought of all these holes with the bullets and all the tea coming out, what a waste of tea that was. <laughs> I've got a weird imagination, I admit it. But anyway, he had to follow orders, and while they were having a cup of tea, what happened next was the scout did a bit of investigation. The scout came back and said, put everything away quickly, put it away now. I've discovered a way through. The enemy's moved. And if we go quickly, 
we can all escape with our lives. And of course, that's what happened. That's why you could tell me the story. No one got injured or shot at all. And this was where, you know, I learned some powerful teachings when there's nothing to do in turmoil. And it really is turmoil, life or death. Do nothing. Have that opportunity to stop, be in the moment, be peaceful, and see what happens next. Wait for things to change. Because there's one thing which you can always promise, that things always do change. Nothing ever stays the same. It always is in flux. And our job in difficult moments, difficult times, whether it's with a virus, how long is this virus going to last? Of course it's not going to last forever. If it lasts forever, we're all going to be dead anyway. So we don't have to worry about anything. Month, two months, three months, I don't know. But it'll soon pass over. So there's nothing to do. Do nothing. And wait until there's something you can do. And that's when you're really effective. But it's more than that. It's something which I've found that when you relax and do nothing, that's when innovative ways of dealing with difficult situations just arise. You're not acting out of habit anymore. You're not just doing just as ordinary you would do. You actually see different ways of doing things. And what is turmoil, what is disaster, you find advantages in. Not just personal advantages, advantages for everybody. It's one of those stories I remember learning from history. They had this great fire of London in 1600 and something. You talk about a bush fire, this destroyed much more in London. But it also destroyed many of the causes of the plague, the Black Deaths. But what it did to a whole lot of central London was totally obliterated. So what do you do? It's not just rebuild, but they rebuilt in London, starting off with a proper sewer system. Known for sewage, underground. They had the opportunity to do that now because there was no buildings on top. So they could put in really good sewage. And I always remember this story because they didn't have um, like um, civil engineers. They didn't know too much about how to deal with flows and turbulence. The mathematics and the experiments, the science wasn't there yet. Well, a little bit of it, but not much. But apparently the person who designed the underground sewage system in central London decided to model it on the way you see the veins on a leaf. The angle, if you look at a leaf, you've got the main uh, line in the middle, the whatever takes the liquid or whatever backwards and forwards, and you have the, the branches and the branches, they, they come off at a certain angle. And the people who designed and built the sewage system in London used exactly that angle. They didn't know why. They thought, well, if it works in nature, it may work underground in London for the sewage. And of course it did. And it was there for about three, four hundred years. And people, until people started using too much fat, and they had fat bergs, and they had, uh, was it those wet wipes bergs, and all these other things blocking it off, but it worked for years, centuries literally. They took advantage of a crisis, and they grew from it. And this is one of the things which I always try and do, whatever crisis, whatever we learn, so whatever things happen to us, we don't just think, oh, isn't it terrible, isn't it awful, I hope it sort of goes away quickly. No, there's always lessons in this for us to learn to do better next time. Sometimes it's just patience. Sometimes it's just learning to see things as other people see things. Widening our wisdom, widening our views. Because one of the other questions which somebody put out about this particular time, it, for the people in Hong Kong, it wasn't just like coronavirus, it was just all the, the difficulties they had be, before with the politics. And politics is always people arguing. 
with one another. Who's right and who's wrong? And sometimes as a monastic, do we argue? Yeah, we argue. But we also have a lot of fun as well. But when we do argue, we always remember just because I'm a senior monk doesn't mean that I'm right. And actually it's quite fun being wrong. How many times, how many times have you been wrong? <laughs> Hundreds of times. <laughs> when you really look at, oh yeah, I remember, that was another mistake I made. And it's quite endearing to admit your mistakes, admit you did something wrong. For example, what I did stupidly, don't mind, okay, maybe because I was tired, but, you know, I was supposed to be uh, taking my little um, tablet. I don't mean a tablet anti-coronavirus. Anti I mean my little um, Samsung tablet, you know, got my, all my emails on there. And I left it at a monastery today. Ah! And I thought at first, oh no, it's got so much information on what, what I do. Then I thought, yeah, I can't do anything. Yeah, I can have more meditation this weekend. Yeah! <laughs> so... Whatever you do, whatever happens, you can always see the positive side of it. And that's what Ajahn Chah taught me, that's how I live my life. Which means whenever there is any turmoil, there's always some benefit in there somewhere. I don't mean financial benefit, how can I make money out of selling my holy water, which is very good against coronavirus. <laughs> No, but you know, if there is any virus, what actually does work? What does work? And of course, who was that person, that crazy doctor who would dress up in a tutu and... Uh, what was it? Patch Adams. Is that right? Was it in that book? Patch Adams. Dr. Patch Adams? Yeah. He just made people laugh. He actually inspired people. He encouraged people. He just gave them a bit more mental energy. And what happened to their sicknesses? They got much better. Maybe, maybe not always cured, but at least you know, they died happily. <laughs> You're going to die anyway, you might as well die with a smile on your face. <laughs> oh, is it that person who, in the mortuary, had a smile on his face, a big laugh on his face? And it's really rare for, you know, the, the what is it called, the pathologist, you know, the coroner, that's what I'm looking for. The coroner, to see someone die with a smile on their face, said, what happened to him? Why was he smiling? He said, we actually got hit by lightning, but he thought it was a camera shot, so he smiled. <laughs> oh, come on! <laughs> so, anyway. Um, yeah, so, the way we see the positive side of things, or we laugh, that you just, those who did laugh, who took the opportunity, you just increased your immunos, immunosuppressant uh, stuff in your blood. So you had a chance there. So you had a chance. <laughs> those are another silly joke from Ajahn Brahm. You lost the opportunity, you know, to, <laughs> to be more immune from things. And of course that's pretty true. So Patch Adams, you know, he sort of proved that. But what I'm trying to say here is that Sometimes when I see you know, what the, I hear from the news and from people, oh, we are in a time not of turmoil but of negativity. We're always seeing things in the baddest way, the worst way it seems, to the point where we cancel everything. Why don't we just cancel life instead of cancel the Grand Prix and the meetings and stuff? Because life is always taking a chance. How many chances have you taken in life? Are we not allowed to take a chance anymore? And just say, well, you know, we've done the odds, we realize we're taking precautions, but this is our Buddhist society in West Australia. In Buddhist society, we should always live life on the edge. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, so we go back to when we do have turmoil, there's nothing to do, do nothing. Get your, pre your perceptions right, what's important, your priorities right. And the other thing, just instead of arguing, 
because I've noticed some people at Higa, they've just got such narrow perceptions. And they don't allow themselves to expand and widen your perceptual apparatus. In other words, to see things in a different way. Okay, what was this one? This, I don't know if I did this last week. You know the trouble with being Ajahn Brahm? I give so many talks every week, I don't know what I've talked about last time. I was talking all day in, in Sydney and Canberra almost, that's what it felt like anyway. So, when I went to one of my uh, gigs, this was in South Korea, I love this gig because it was totally the sort of thing which I shouldn't, well, which I, I didn't really belong. It was a 2016 or whatever World Computer Congress. Yeah, I've got a tablet, but I keep forgetting it. And for anything important, I asked you know, this monk over here, he sort of fixes up computers and stuff for me. And the point that I gave, this wasn't just an ordinary talk, this was a keynote address. A keynote address at the World Computer Conference in Daejeon, in Korea. They really looked after me too. You know, they gave me business class seats, they paid for it, a nice hotel. And they enjoyed my presentation so much, honestly, they gave a $2,000 donation to the Buddhist Society. You know what people from my country used to call a nice little earner. But, <laughs> but what really impressed them, because when I first went there, you know, you, you're given a keynote address, that was number three in line, it was the, I think, it was the um, minister or something or other in Korea opened a conference and then the president of the computer congress and then me, number three, the keynote address setting the whole tone for the conference. That was really cool. And people you know, asked me, what are you doing here? You're a monk. You know, are you, so, you started some monk computer, co computer um, company or something. They're all big CEOs. I was just a CEM. You know what CEM means, don't you? Chief Executive Monk. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, what I did, I said, one of the most important parts of any company, of life, of being in the BSWA, Buddhist Society of West Australia, or Bodhinyaya International Foundation in Hong Kong, of being a human being, is learning how to innovate. Don't just respond in the same old way. You have turmoil, you have crises. How are you going to respond? Sometimes our knowledge restricts us. Sometimes it creates our opinions and we argue with others because our knowledge base is too narrow. So this was companies looking to make more money. So I used that knowledge, this is where they were at, to teach them how to innovate. And I held up, and this is basic Buddhist insight meditation practice. That's where it comes from. I know my Buddhism and so I'm not teaching things which I don't know about. And I held up a bottle. And I asked everybody in the audience, what am I holding up? And the people, you know, some, I know one guy there, he was a head of, of uh, sec cyber security for the European Union. These are really important people there. He was actually one of the ministers of technology from New South Wales was there as well. So we had a really good time talking, but anyway, now was their time to ask, answer the question. They said bottle, they said glass, they said half full, they said all sorts of stuff. But I kept on asking, what is it? Because that's just your old knowledge. Your old knowledge, it's a bottle, it's glass at the top, orange at the bottom, it's, you know, cylindrical and they had all these amazing descriptions and I said what else do you see until after about five minutes they'd run out of descriptions their vocabulary was exhausted I said now you can start seeing something to see what you haven't seen before to notice what was hidden by all those words to see something new which is called innovation. You know how often it is when we have a problem, we just look in the books. If not in the books, 
in our own memory and we just keep repeating what we think worked before and of course times change viruses change governments change responses change at least they should to fit the different problem so I said what is this and they kept on looking silently to see more things this could be I know somebody once showed me a clip from, because I don't usually watch movies, a clip from, that's right, the Gods Must Be Crazy movie. Does anyone remember that movie? Where somebody threw a cocoa, what was it, Coca-Cola bottle out of the plane, and these Kalahari Bushmen, they saw a Coca-Cola bottle. And what did they use that for? The wife used it to actually to, to roll out um, uh, like chapatis. It makes a very good, like, uh, pastry roller. I think he also, I think she also used it, or did he use it on her to knock, to hit him over the head? <laughs> I shouldn't really say that, should I? But anyway, they, they had some very innovative uses for, <laughs> for a bottle, which you wouldn't see. They used it as a roller. But it's wonderful that when we see different ways of doing things, which means our views instead of being so narrow, become wider and wider and wider, instead of arguing with one another, which is one of the problems which we have, arguing on who's right and who's wrong. And of course a classic Buddhist tale, you know that about the, the seven elephants? You must have heard that tale before, about the seven elephants. They were all blind and they were arguing, what is a human being? They've never seen one before, so they decide the only way you can find out what a human being is, you know, but direct experience, find out for yourself. So they all went off and found a human being, they, they touched it. When they came back, they compared their experiences and they all agreed, human beings are flat, like, um, like hamburger patties. <laughs> oh, come on. That's the only way you can feel. Elephants aren't all that sensitive. They squashed every person they found. That's why they agree, they're all the same, flat. <laughs> I think, yeah, I, t I told that story to Julia Gillard years ago, and Kevin Rudd, who else was there? I don't know, at some conference, I thought it was funny. <laughs> anyway, the <laughs> the so this is actually where it's there, you know, the real story about feeding an elephant, elephants feeding, no, that's a men feeding an elephant, and then instead of arguing who was right, combining our experience. You know, that's respecting all other people. We don't just think, ah, oh, those people are in power. They're just motivated by money. Or they're just trying to, just to, to do what somebody else tells them to do. Listen. And just to respect each other. When you respect other people, sometimes you feel this other person is just totally against you. But you respect them, and things change. I don't know, last, last week when I was here, did I tell the story of, the, of bowing to the Buddha? And the Catholic principle I did, didn't I? Yeah, okay, yeah. There was a, if, you didn't, if you didn't hear that story, Please log in to the BSWA website and hopefully it'll be on there. Hopefully. <laughs> is it on there, Bill? Yeah, it is. Okay, great. Marvellous. <laughs> what, you don't watch our website? Shame, shame. <laughs> no, anyway. So, um, on that was, instead of having conflict between different uh, religions, we try and get everyone together by finding something. It's all about how we bow to a Buddha. We don't bow to a Buddha. We bow to what it represents. Remember what I said last week? What does it represent? Virtue, peace and compassion. That's easy to bow to. So you can see there's a conflict between two different religions overcome by couching the problem in a totally different way. Not just worshipping my faith and demeaning your f faith, but finding what was the heart of that faith. 
or that other time similar but that was the occasion at UWA University of West Australia when I was presenting is a chaplaincy conference I was presenting alongside a Benedictine abbot a really dear old friend who passed away that was Abbot Placid and I was asked a question by Father Frank Brennan he's a Jesuit incredibly intellectual heading he headed the a little group which was going to add a human rights constitution to the Australian Constitution for intellectual heavyweight so when he asked me a question I realized I can't joke amazing intellectuals don't have a sense of humor or do they I don't know but anyway I didn't try it but nevertheless he asked me this wonderful question which many of you you know if you haven't heard this before you know what is the Buddhist concept of God because you know being a Catholic, he was really interested. That was an important part of his life. You know, belief in God, worship of God or whatever, but you know, what is the Buddhist idea of that? And I told him that Abba Placid, I've known for a long time, as a Buddhist monk I made a point of always trying to find contacts with people of other faiths and religions or no religion. Because I realized the dangers of being too narrow minded. And so, this Abbot Placid, it was very easy to get on with, up in New Norcia Monastery. And so, he would often tell me that one of his fundamental beliefs was, uh, and this is what he said to me, everybody is searching for God. He said, that's, that's my belief, run, you know, running his life. And I never want to demean anyone, diminish anybody's uh, beliefs. I want to respect them find out what do you mean by that you get a lot of wisdom when you listen to people who are different than you so anyway when I listened to him and I realized just what a wonderful little possibility that is to answer the question of this intellectual about what is a Buddhist idea of God so I said you know if that's what my friend keeps on saying everyone is searching for God what are you searching for each one of you here searching for respect you know what it's like if you're LGBTQIA plus sometimes it's just total disrespect I want to change you can we change that is just so nasty you want to be respected you're a migrant from another country you want to be appreciated treated fairly you're somebody with say autism spectrum disorder Imagine what that must be like. You're not treated like everybody else. You're almost diminished. So people want to be respected. You want to be also able to give respect to others. It's a wonderful thing to have someone totally different than you and just you know, say, I, I care for you and I understand what you're doing and why. And also just a wonderful thing to be able to love somebody and to be loved to be able to give and receive that love in all sorts of different ways and people say well you're a Buddhist monk what do you know about that? a lot how you can love people just your type of love as a Buddhist monk is open the door of your heart to so many people be really close to people but in a, another way which sometimes the world doesn't imagine could, could exist there's so many people, like all those people over in, in Hong Kong hopefully you'll listen to me you know, you, sometimes you know when I meet you you know, that I care for you and I really open the heart, my heart for you and just really, really wish you so much happiness and well-being and this little, I said little problem okay, you may think it's a big problem but it will pass away that's one of those great little sayings, remember that saying the emperor's, the emperor's ring. I'll go back to um, about the Buddhist idea of God in a moment. But the emperor's ring simile. That was when there was a young fellow took over the empire from his father who died, 
and he didn't really know how to run an empire. He, you know, his father died too quickly. So that whenever things were going well, he'd hold parties and celebrations and, and stuff, which, you know, had a great time. But then when things started going wrong, he couldn't take the, the pain of, and the disappointment and the frustration. Life was going really, really difficult and bad. Economy's no going well. And so he would stay in his room and get depressed. So he wouldn't be able to do anything. And so, in those days, you know, the king was just, you know, the all-powerful, so they couldn't tell him off. They had to be a little bit more subtle. So they got this ring made for the emperor, and a gold ring, and they just presented it to this young man. And all it had on the outside were the three, four words. I had to quickly count. This too will pass. On the on the ring, they told the young man, the young emperor, to wear it at all occasions, which he did. And of course, he'd look at it. What are they meaning by this? And he soon got the message. When things were going well, as things were going well in Hong Kong for many years, he look at the ring. This too will pass. And he really remembered that. He never took prosperity, health, harmony, peace for granted. That's the mistake of people. Things are going well, we think it's always going to go well. You can always have booms, you can always have good health. You can always have a wonderful relationship with the person you committed to and exchange rings for. Imagine that if at a marriage you inscribed that on the rings you exchanged. This too will pass. <laughs> in your marriage. <laughs> what would that do? That would extend the marriages. That would make the... Always remembering, you just can't take it for granted that person's committed to you, they'll be like that forever. So that's what he did, he saw that and he worked harder to, to keep the, the kingdom or the, the place running smoother all the time. Which meant the good times lasted longer than anybody could ever remember. So the same in a marriage. Because you're always working at it, you're never taking it for granted. It means that your relationship will prosper much longer. And of course, when things were difficult, this too will pass. You didn't need to get that depressed. Coronavirus, it will pass. Ajahn Brahm, he will pass. <laughs> Whatever happens, it passes. So you just learn how to do as much as you possibly can. Even though, you know, it's, it actually gives you the light at the end of the tunnel. You can actually do something. That's why it's just so positive. So anyway, that was the, the Emperor's Three Questions. So in Hong Kong, this, this too will pass. I guarantee that. Number two is back to the uh, solving the turmoil between different ways of looking at life with the idea of a God. So what what, what are you searching for? Peace? It's a wonderful word. Health? Fulfillment. It's a really important word, fulfillment. You want to actually be doing something to make a better world. It's not just for yourself. I've never met anyone who's selfish. They may appear that way, but you talk to them and give them an opportunity to be able to do something for somebody else. And they just they just open up and they blossom. So have a whole list of things which you are searching for in life. Love and to be loved, to be cared for, you know, to to have peace, to be able to serve and make a difference in this world. All of those things which Buddhists, which uh, Muslims, which atheists non-believers, agnostics, liberals, labor, which you're all searching for. I say, well, that must be what God is. So that's a Buddhist idea of God. Love and to be loved, to care, to be fulfilled, to be respected, to be, have the friendship of others. I said, if that's what, Buddhist, what God is, then that, that's easy enough to worship. Do you worship peace? 
kindness, forgiveness, love. These aren't things which belong to a being. They're there, almost in the atmosphere, in the air. They're in you. For you to practice whenever you want, to have a wonderful world. So you know, that was this little ways of, of breaking down these barriers between two people of different views, different ideas, who just will not talk to one another. You say, you're wrong, you're bad, you're evil, or whatever it is. And that causes the problem. It is a narrow-mindedness of politics or religion, which is wonderful when you can break that down and have people talking to each other and realizing one of the greatest things which we need in our world is to break down those barriers between peoples. And we've done that a lot, but there's still so much more to go. You know, with uh, sexual orientation, with genders, now also with people with disabilities, which I say aren't disabilities. If you see them closer, there's amazing things which people have with people who are smart, just the usual thing. How many people in this room are above average intelligence? Only half of you. The other half are below average intelligence. That's what average means, you know. There's nothing wrong with it. It doesn't matter what part of the world you're from, even Hong Kong. Half the people in Hong Kong are below average intelligence. Average over the whole of Hong Kong, that is. <laughs> so it's... <laughs> Instead of criticizing and rejecting people and think they don't belong, bring everybody in. Which means that we can have a peaceful, inclusive world. Because when people feel excluded because they're poor, because they're different, because they follow a different religion, a different gender, when people get excluded, that's where we start to have turmoil. So, little by little, we can understand the causes. We can learn. And that's all the turmoil, that's its purpose in our world. We learn from these things. We learn, grow, and do better next time. Thank you for listening. Sadhu. Okay, is there any questions on the internet? Yeah, we'll do that. Here we go. Wow, okay, I'll do it quickly. Dear Ajahn Brahm, the guiding principle in my life is being kind and compassionate to others. I hate politics and confrontation, but now in Hong Kong, due to political and social unrest issues, there is so much hatred and violence. Even my beloved one has lost his empathy and compassion in this political environment. I feel so lost and sad. I don't know how to deal with this. Could you please give me some guidance? Is if your guiding principle in life is being kind and compassionate to others, please be kind and compassionate to your... Um, what is it? To your beloved one. He's lost his empathy and compassion, so please help him find it. Just like I think in the United States they do this on Easter time, they do the Easter egg search. So what you can do, simple things, um, get a little box, and put in there, like, love, compassion, just on a piece of paper, or something which says love, something which says compassion. Wrap it all up in beautiful gift paper, and then put a little um, gift card on it, say, to my loved one from, from yourself, and then offer it to him as a gift. <laughs> to remember the importance and find love and compassion back again. So, just because other people have lost their love and compassion is no reason why you should. These are personal possessions. Would you allow people to take away your money or steal your car? What's more important? Your money, your car or your love and compassion? Don't allow anyone to steal it. I heard your experience on meditating in the forest and the proliferation of a dangerous animal. What's a comparable analogy for those of us who do not meditate in forests? You meditate in the concrete jungle, <laughs> over in Hong Kong or Sydney or wherever. 
So there are more dangerous animals actually in the cities than there are in the forests. In the forest, the animals there, they just usually leave you alone as long as you don't bother them. And they're really fun to watch. But what was it, this huge, uh, it was 2.8 meter long uh, dugite. Came to visit me once over in um, Bodhinyana Monastery. I know that because it was a hot day and it shaded itself along the, the wall of one of the huts and I built that hut so I know exactly how long it is. Actually, 5.40, no, 2.94. And its tail and head just fatted. And it just came to visit me. Came and had a look at me while I was washing my bowl. Had a look at me. And I just, okay, you can do whatever you want, snake. You know, within striking distance, I knew it was deadly. Huge snake. Biggest one I've ever seen over in Bodhinyana Monastery. And then I just carried on washing my bowl. The next thing I noticed, when I looked up again, it actually turned around. And its head was one way, its tail was pointing at me, totally safe. It felt at ease. So animals in the forest, if you care for them, they leave you alone. They become your friends. So that's why if you live alone and respect the other um, dangerous animals in Hong Kong, if you're kind to them, you're safe. For those of us who don't practice meditation, could you share advice or suggestions that can at least alleviate panic, fear, hatred or anger? Thank you with Metta. Look, if you, have, if you are hungry, it's like ask me, can you please suggest something other than eating food to alleviate my hunger? The fear and hatred and panic, these are mental problems. They're only solved by having a stronger mind. Having a stronger mind takes some meditation, takes letting go of the past and the future. It takes a lot of wisdom, and those are the things you learn. That's why we have Buddhism, to learn how to train the mind. If you want to have strong muscles in your body, go to the gym. If you want to have a strong mind so you don't succumb to such things as fear and panic, learn how to meditate. It's not that hard. Ajahn, what is our lesson learned from coronavirus epidemic which is affecting literally the whole world now? Thank you, Sada, Sada, Sada. Please excuse me, I still feel it's an overreaction, but our governments are doing that, so make the best use of it. When I was in Indonesia recently, I was in Bali. I was in a nice hotel. And I think, wow, what a wonderful place it would be to get coronavirus. Two weeks quarantine in a five-star hotel. I wasn't to be so lucky. So, yeah, sometimes it means you can simplify your life. You don't have to go out so much, which is wonderful. It means you don't have to always think you must wipe your bum with toilet paper. <laughs> there are other alternatives, like well, try water. That's how we used to do it in time as young monks, or sometimes leaves. It allows you to innovate. It means you can't travel so much, which is, means I can be here with you more time. I wouldn't be here next week if it wasn't for coronavirus. I'd be in Hong Kong, so I could spend more time with you. I can relax more and be more peaceful. What else can I do? Oh yeah, because that no, so many plane trips are canceled, not just mine, but other people's, it means there's less carbon going into the atmosphere. This is really, coronavirus is really good, probably, I'd imagine, for global warming. It's going to keep it cooler. It must be a positive somewhere. So look at all the positives for it. What's happening here, you've got a choice. Between being negative, oh, it's terrible, it's awful. Or looking at it in another way. It's a training. Just like, because I was talking with somebody with cancer just a day or two ago, I don't know how many people, they shocked me when I went to the lo <coughs> a local cancer group. This is cancer. Which is more serious, coronavirus or cancer? Okay, so why don't we have the same response to cancer? Or even worse. Anyway, when I went many times to talk to people with cancer, in big groups, they were the ones who told me, and the first time, you know, it really shocked me. Thought, 
did I hear this correctly? They said it was the best thing which ever happened to them. And I don't know how many times people have said that. They'd have a cancer, they'd have breast taken off, chemotherapy for such a long time, and they said the best thing which ever happened to them. What are you talking about? And of course, now I know that talking to them for such a long time, I never had cancer myself, but they were saying that it changed their whole life, the meaning of life changed. They understand much more about what was important, the priorities of life, what to put in the jar first. So that's why they, thank you, thank you, thank you. All my priorities totally changed. I lived a much more happy life because it was the big, biggest kick at the backside. But they learned from it, they grew from it. So that's the lessons you should learn about what's important in life. And what advice, a precious gift to us, would you give to me and my girlfriend who have just started our relationship two months ago? Uh, of course, that is just look in your girlfriend's eye, or I don't know, maybe I imagine I'm looking in her eye, and say to her, darling, from now on you must not think of yourself. That one, you know. And then imagine looking in your own eye and say, I must not think of myself. From today on I must not think of my girlfriend either. I must not think of my boyfriend. You're in a partnership, it's always about us, yeah. You're in it together. So don't make your own decisions. Don't sort of tell your partner what to do. About us. It's letting go of what you want and see what we want. That's one thing. And the other thing is uh, with the, what was the other one was I saying with the, oh yeah, that, I think that's enough for now because I've got a few more questions here. So, <laughs> uh, so that's one thing to do. And oh, also the forgiveness thing, because I was mentioning this to someone earlier and it was very powerful. I've only once got myself in a celebrity, um, it's just, what is it, New Idea or Vogue or something, over in um, the Malaysian edition when I did a celebrity wedding for this big TV star in, in Malaysia. And uh, afterwards she sent me this, the copy of the magazine, had a big picture of me in the, in the celebrity magazines. And anyway, that uh, she still keeps in contact, sends an email every now and again, how it's about eight years now, I think, and her marriage to her husband is still really, really good. And she said, the most important thing which I said to them, and this is to the boyfriend girlfriend, even though you're not totally committed yet, nevertheless, I should say the commitment thing. What's the difference between just being a boyfriend and girlfriend and getting married? The difference is the level of commitment. If you're just boyfriend and girlfriend, it's like, and, or getting married, it's, a, it's the same as the difference between bacon and eggs. Bacon and eggs. In bacon and eggs, the chicken is only involved, but the pig is committed. <laughs> Some people get it. It gives his whole life, gives everything. So, but anyway, they do a forgiveness ceremony every year. So, and she, she says she does this every year with her husband. That every year they do a little ceremony, because I told them to at their marriage, and they continue to do so. They meet, each, they, uh, just the two of them together, maybe a simple dinner somewhere, just private, and they just, either she does it one year, he does it the next year first. They say to each other, darling, whatever I've done in the past year, by body, by speech or mind, on purpose or just by accident, which has hurt you, or offended you, or disappointed you, I sincerely, honestly ask your forgiveness. I'm a human being and sometimes I get in bad moods. But I love you and I care for you. I really just want this relationship to continue. Please forgive me. And there's things which I didn't do which I should have done. Please forgive me. And then, according to how the Buddha taught, if someone asks you forgiveness like that, you have to give it. And then it's the other partner's turn. They say back, whatever I've done by body, speech or mind over the past 12 months, intentional <coughs> or unintentional, I also ask your forgiveness. Please forgive me. And they're forgiven. What you're doing is realizing both of you are imperfect, but you're willing to acknowledge your mistakes and ask forgiveness. 
And that gives a huge amount of power to the relationship. A little forgiveness ceremony. So anyway, that's what we can do to your, for your boyfriend, girlfriend. Which meditation practice you'd suggest to work with fear and regain peace in an extended period of turmoil? Just like that soldier, just find a nice quiet place and sit down and have a cup of tea. Let go of the past and the future and enjoy the present moment. So that way that you actually see the problem in a totally different light, perspectives change, priorities change. Simple, you know sometimes what type of meditation is there? Well, there's only one type of meditation. You've got a heavy cup, you put it down, let it go and take a rest. Uh, hello Ajahn, do you have a Buddhist way to fight against addictions? Are you shopaholic, alcoholic? Yeah, run out of money. <laughs> <laughs> then you can't afford it. <laughs> but a lot of times you all know that addiction, shopaholic, alcoholic, is always escaping from, usually from yourself. So learn a bit of self-love, acceptance, kindness. You don't have to be perfect to love yourself. The most perfect tree in the forest is not the straight ones. As I said, they're the damaged ones. They're the beautiful ones. So you look at yourself, yeah, I can relate to that tree, that's just like me, bent, twisted all over the place, damaged by life, and it's gorgeous. So you don't need to run away. How do you keep yourself calm when bad things are happening? If you can do anything about the bad things, then fine. But if you can't do anything about the bad things, then don't be a bad thing yourself. Keep calm. When there's nothing to do, do nothing. Don't just do something, sit there. Learn how to be peaceful. And you find this incredible thing that sometimes when you do nothing, life changes and things do get better. And when you try and interfere with them, they get worse. Lastly, uh, don't cling to views. In history, there were at least three major Buddhist councils, each led to a big division of sects. Yeah, just the men and women. Oh, no, oh, sorry, S-E-C-T-S. All, all due to, to, to one thing, difference of views. Sometimes, and I read that question earlier because it was on a piece of paper somebody gave me, but you know, that's not historically true. So the first council was just getting all of the teachings of the Buddha together. There was no sort of differences of opinions. It was just, oh, what did you hear? What did you hear? Putting it all together. Later on, if you know, I've got five minutes here, two minutes maybe, I'm already going over time. But this was where there were some monks who started to handle money and keep money. And that was one of the most important rules for monks. That's why we're called monks. You know, because, you know, we're not into money. And so, because of that, that they had a big meeting and they said, well, the Buddha said we shouldn't have money. Oh, but times have changed. This is not 2,500 years ago, this is 2,400 years ago. <laughs> so times have changed. Mm -hmm. They always have that thing, oh, you've got to have money these days. You know, it's, it's not the same as, as when the Buddha was alive. And then you get, like, the forest monks, like myself, and and uh, Venerable Ananda sitting next to me, you know, we don't have money, we do very well. Look at me, I travel all over the world without money. When I was in Sydney, I had my Opal card, paid for by the Buddhist Society of Western Australia, it was wonderful. You just log on at the airport and you just go right through and go here and go there and all over the place. So, who needs money? Anyway, <laughs> I'd have a very interesting life without any money. No credit card, no um, bank account, no cash. Anyway, so anyway, that was the second one. They did have a difference of opinion, so of course they had an eye. Well, they respected one another, but always said, even if somebody is different than you, have different ideas, you must always respect them and be kind to them. Even if they have different politics. Even if they have different ideas. Change their ideas if they're violent ideas or they're negative ideas. Not with argument, because people don't listen to argument. Change it with your behavior. Be kind to them. You know, some years ago, we were having an argument over here with those of you old enough with clay trucks going past our monastery. And during the middle of that time, Ajahn Sujato, who was here, it was Christmas time, so he sent a Christmas card to all our enemies. And they were, just, they were just, wow, they never expected that. You know, because you know, they were uh, Western tradition. 
So we sent Chris, a Christmas card to all the people we were fighting in court with. It was really neat. Anyway, so anyway, I think that's probably enough questions for here. Hope that was okay over in Hong Kong, but remember, it will pass what you're going through. And like the rest of the world, go on the virus, please be kind, don't let it destroy your lifestyle. Being kind to one another, caring for one another, and going to places together. If ever you are in a supermarket, please take some of your excess toilet paper there and just give it out to people. <laughs> Do things differently. It might feel a bit crazy, but why not? Wonderful way of doing things. Okay, thank you for listening. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Okay, should maybe any question from here? Other than, I, I think I can read the minds. Can we go now? Question. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we can go now. <laughs> Very good. Okay. We pay respect to Buddha Dhamma Sangha. Or, instead, to virtue, peace, and compassion. Ah, Sama, Sambo. Supati Pano Bhagavato Sawaka Sango Sangang Namami Okay. <laughs>